And we are here at Vapor Central uh, 667 Young Street on the second floor for part of the Karma Cup Speaker Series. We're at Vapor Central 2018 Karma Cup Speaker Series. Unfortunately, kind of how I see cannabis falling on the recreational side. I don't think that it's going to be organic. I don't think, well, even now, how many LPs sell organic herb? How many of the dispensaries that you go and buy cannabis at will pass microbial and, and pesticide testing if you actually took them to a lab to have them tested? So you often have a strong in Canada and the dispensary um, models. I think there's good in both, personally, but I think it's generally like um, a small percentage that you actually see, you know, good, organic, clean meds available. Yeah, 100%. It's uh, also really interesting. Uh, we're dealing with full whole plant extraction here, where if you look in pharmaceuticals anywhere else, it's not exactly what you're getting in that tiny little pill. Um, any medicine should be exactly dosed and easy to consume. That's why pills are actually really popular in the medical world, just because of easy delivery. So it's a whole new era for pharmaceuticals to be kind of looked at where there's a medical plant, but it's the whole entourage effect of the whole plant that's actually making it uh, have those actual medicinal properties. So you see a lot of pharmaceutical companies where a lot of the solvent extraction actually comes from this pharmaceutical world. So it is actually on the medical side. It is actually already approved. It is actually already used. The reason why you see uh, giant CO2 extraction facilities and you see um, all the CO2 extraction technology and that's 100% from the pharmaceutical industry and they've been coming into the industry and trying to apply their same philosophies, same extraction methods, but they're hitting challenges because the whole uh, cannabis plant is really what creates that whole entourage effect. So there's this whole interesting divide now where it's like, well, we want to maintain as much as the plant material as possible, but a lot of the methods and the pharmaceutical SOPs are quite the opposite. They're about precision extraction. They're about reducing things to only a few elements, if not just one, and then uh, bringing them back together to create that pharmaceutical, medical uh, drug, if you will. <clears throat> yeah, and what I would add to that too is that you have to keep in mind that cannabis is a phytoremediative plant. So one of the projects that a group of, that I was involved with back in the 90s when we were doing hemp cultivation in Manitoba, uh, my friends and I got hemp growing in Manitoba for the first time in 73 years through some activism and approaching our Minister of Finance and Agriculture. And you may have heard of a project in Chernobyl where they were using cannabis plants as phytoremediation to remove radioactive nucleotides out of the soil. That was started by our group, Consolidated Growers and Processors. And this was found out accidentally, actually, from one of Canada's first hemp farmers, Joe Strobel. Um, he was growing on a tobacco field, which they spray radium-226 which is a radioactive nucleotide. Uh, it's why tobacco is radi radioactive, actually. Um, and so it raises the nicotine levels naturally on the field, which is pretty, like they're not allowed to do it in a lab. Um, so radium-226 plays an important part in producing the addictive qualities of tobacco, and that's why they spray it. And when you burn it, it turns into polonium-210 and lead-210 and you know, half-lives of thousands of years. All they do is mutate healthy DNA. Really, really nasty stuff. Uh, because of it, the tobacco farmers have to measure the radiation levels of their fields uh, after each crop. And when they had grown their first experimental hemp crop in 1994, this was here in Ontario, um, when they measured the field, it had like a, like, a, like a substantially lower radiation levels. And they just, they were baffled by it until someone figured out to test the hemp. And of course, the hemp had absorbed all of these... Um, these things out of the soil, for those of you that aren't familiar with phytoremediation, it's plants that, you know, there's sunflowers that can absorb nickel. So it's a, a way of mining. If you find a rich deposit of nickel, you can plant sunflowers all over that mountainside and, you know, basically burn and smelt down the sunflowers to collect the nickel that the plant has pulled up into its, um, into its system. So cannabis is, is very much a phytoremediative uh, plant. Uh, and it will pull nasty things out of the soil. So this becomes, you know, an important factor in understanding when you're growing cannabis as a medicine, 
that you should really be aware of the quality of the soil that you're growing that cannabis on. Uh, this becomes a pretty important factor. And getting back to what Dave was saying about pharmaceutical companies, I'm, I'm quite sure it's probably one of the reasons why they're more interested in producing. Oh, there's a couple of reasons. It's one of the reasons. Another reason would be the, the accurate dosage. So certain people work great with whole plant profiles and other people, you know, more sensitive people, things like Crohn's disease, things like Dravet syndrome, some of the really um, touchy uh, epileptic um, diseases, they require very accurate dosing. So, you know, there's going to be a place for monomolecular medicines, CBD, uh, THCA, um, isolates removed from oils that have either been extracted with BHO or CO2 or cryoethanol and then taking that and turning it into distillate, which is basically decarboxylating it and removing the terpene content and concentrating the cannabinoid content into the high 90s. And then from there, there's um, you know crystal chromatography and other processes that you can actually crystallize the um, cannabinoids out of the solution. And then you have these monomolecular medicines, which the pharmaceutical companies are much more stoked on because they can create formulations with those medicines and those medicines can stay accurate to like the, the, the nanogram every single time, which, you know, maybe if you're a puffer that loves the entourage effect and loves the full terpenes, and that's not for you, but you certainly wouldn't want to like be an activist against that because maybe some five-year-old kid somewhere with Dravet syndrome who, if the cannabinoid profile changes the slightest bit, if the terpene profile changes the slightest bit, if there are chemicals in the soil that the plant has absorbed up, these are gonna have a very detrimental effect on that end user. So I always sort of um, promote people to look at cannabis as a quiver. Um, there's no one arrow better than the other. It's just the arrow that you prefer in that moment that you wanna pull out of your quiver. But I'm certainly not interested in having one or two arrows in my quiver when it comes to cannabis. I prefer to have you know 50 to 100. Yeah, absolutely. And with the solvent extraction, back to uh, safe extraction a little bit, um, you know, the downsides to most solvents is their volatil volatility and, you know, creating an explosive situation, which is in uh, the case of butane and propane. All these things can be easily avoided with uh, the proper equipment, training, and uh, education overall. Um, one of the things we've been doing is training everyone from uh, our end users and the operators to first responders to anyone that's involved in the, from the code inspectors. I've spent a lot of time uh, working with fire departments in the last two years, um, bringing everyone up on to speed as, as especially in the US, we move towards uh, legalization and uh, licensing. Um, there are definitely downsides to it, um, you know, as far as having solvents left over, using dirty solvents, that's probably one of the biggest ones people don't talk about, is how clean your solvent that you're using is. Just like Mark was saying earlier, you know, with the water, um, you have to make sure everything is perfectly clean, even the water itself. Um, same goes with, uh, you know, cryoethanol extraction, um, the CO2, the hydrocarbons, um, starting off with that clean, uh, product, that clean solvent to begin with, the clean plant material is the most important fact. You can't start anywhere else but there. Um, once that's taken care of, uh, you know, doing the actual process safely is the biggest issue with uh, solvent extraction. Um, education is the number one key. Uh, even in non- um, cannabis extraction scenarios, hydrocarbons are used in our everyday lives on uh, an extreme level. It's probably one of the most used gases out of any gas that we have that we use on an everyday basis, everything from cooking our food, powering our houses, um, having any sort of uh, um, generators going that compress air, simple things like that that you don't even think of are used on extremely large scale uh, it's where we have really good data on that. 70% of LPG, um, LPG is uh, the same as it's, uh, butane and propane. There's a whole array of gases that fall in that category, all hydrocarbons. They, um, the biggest issue is user error. So 70% of LPG incidents in the United States at least are from uh, a lack of education and or training. So on my side of things, 
uh, that's indefinitely important um, and is going to continue to be the most important thing and has been my personal uh, focus when it comes to safe extraction. So it's not just the extraction process, but it's all the SOPs, anyone who's entering the building, anyone who's interacting with it. Um, it's a whole education process that uh, has been going really well. And we've made great strides in the last five or six years from uh, people using cans of butane, which have all sort of degreasers, anti-rust agents, all this terrible, nasty stuff. Um, uh, you know, running it through glass tubes into a Pyrex dish and <laughs> using double boiler systems to evaporate it off, uh, mixing the hydrocarbons with air, creating potentially explosive situations. And as Mark was saying uh, a little bit earlier before, um, up until, you know, solvent extraction, we didn't really see deaths from cannabis manufacturing um, or even any major injuries. The the biggest thing was uh, legalities and um, being prosecuted for um, working with the plants. Um, so solvent extraction definitely added in a new element. Uh, a lot of it didn't help with uh, the negative stigma against cannabis. But the reason why we do use solvents is because in some situations they're really irreplaceable. Um, doing crystallization, all sorts of different types of uh, separating processes. Um, require solvents. Um, I've actually been working with water as a solvent also in a lot of different ways. Um, but, you know, some things can't replace alcohol in certain situations. The hydrocarbon is a nonpolar solvent that uh, leaves all the water behind for the most part, and you can do it with extremely low temperatures and virtually no pressure, um, giving you the highest and fullest uh, spectrum of terpenes out of any other sort of extraction. So there's all sorts of advantages and disadvantages to each process. And like Mark was saying, I would never want, you know, just a couple arrows in my quiver when it comes to cannabis. Um, I feel that all types of extraction have their place. And that's why I've been working so hard to keep uh, solvent extraction uh, in the industry and teaching people and providing the equipment to do it safely, efficiently, um, and to get rid of that negative stigma and work through it that solvent extraction has really caused the cannabis industry. I guess I'd go back to one of the points you made in regards to the importance of clean solvents and clean water. You know, these petrochemical companies are brilliant in the way that they can reuse their um, byproducts of their industry. So the one that's in water, of course, is fluoride, which is a byproduct of the aluminum industry. Um, it's a toxic, it's a neurotoxic. It's cl it was classified by the US military as an intellect suppressant. And I'm pretty sure the first time it was ever given to humans was when Hitler tried to docilize the Jews before gassing them, uh, at least in his mind, out of existence. And so these companies have ways of releasing these neurotoxins and these absolute poisons into their own products and so solvents contain all of these different products in um, naphtha they call it um, rust inhibitor uh, in butane and propane they call it uh, ethyl mercapatine there's all sorts of different names for these compounds and it's very important whether you're making water hash whether you're making solvent based extracts that you acquire solvents, whether it be water or petrochemical-based ones, that they are clean, that they are, do not contain these, partic these particular um, toxins because they concentrate, uh, they're oil-soluble, they concentrate into your product rather than out. And um, I think it's kind of the beginning of safe extraction is to make sure that you know, I don't like to run water hash with fluoride-rich water, I, and I don't use fluoride ice. I prefer to keep it out of my hash completely. And uh, I, the, my friends that use solvent-based extraction processes are, are much the same way. It was actually a friend, Khalid, who was a big BHO maker. Um, he came on Hash Church. I'm not sure if many of you have ever seen that show, Hash Church, that I do on YouTube. Generally, every Sunday, I'm supposed to be doing it right now, actually, but uh, I'm here. And so, thank you for that. Um, what's that? Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. And so we, we had Khalid on Hash Church, and he was a but butane maker, and he sort of discovered that, you know, 
there was this contaminated oil. He was the one that dubbed it the mystery oil, whereas if he took the can or container, like a large container, a cylinder of, of butane, and he sort of distilled it through his unit, he would end up with this oil in the end. That was He just couldn't figure out what it was, and he, tried, he took it to a lab, and he tried to get the breakdown on it, and I guess it's like a patented recipe from the petrochemical industry, so it's like... Um, you're not really allowed to find out exactly what it is. He couldn't anyway. He went to multiple labs, and then he, be, then he switched to CO2, and then, he, and then he found it in the CO2 cylinders too. You know, It was this, this oil that basically goes from the nozzle to the, you know, like a lubrication oil. At least that's what they claim it is. I'm more of the mentality that I'm, I'm not super trusting of petrochemical industries. I, I believe that you could get gases and clean them up, but I don't believe that you would want to trust them to, to do that work for you. They're just, just generally from what they're doing to the planet, how that whole industry works. They don't seem to me to be the most, uh, right, the most trustworthy of people. And, and that's just the case in a lot of instances. Also with water cleanliness, there's, they're constantly trying to put things in the water that uh, just shouldn't be there. And if I'm using water um, to, to use as an extraction, um, not as a solvent, but definitely as a carrier, uh, as a transfer chamber, if you will, for water extraction. I'm, I'm not sure what your guys' level of understanding of these extraction processes are. We kind of just came in at a high level without really explaining the simplicity of the processes. Maybe you guys want to hear a little bit about how the processes work? So I would like to expand on that mystery oil just a little bit to sure. explain it and why you see it in CO2 and in hydrocarbons and in basically any other gas. A huge reason is because of the pumps that are used to move the gases around. There are all these giant piston-driven pumps. Mm -hmm. they, all, they all require lubrication or else the pumps break down themselves. And uh, so that always makes it in just because of the process of moving it around. So Mark is 100% correct. The only way to have a truly clean solvent is to take a raw solvent and to clean it yourself. So there are a few companies out there that are working on um, scaling up uh, hydrocarbon cleaning processes to where you actually go and scrub the uh, the gases depending on or the solvents themselves depending on what they are but a lot of the entire industrial process uh, that's out there um, is just not food grade it's it's not uh, friendly to human consumption in a lot of ways um, so that is a whole uh, other aspect to it that you're right you can't trust the solvents uh, from where they come from and uh, having solvents cleaned post uh, process is uh, really where the magic is going to happen. You can clean the hydrocarbons down to a pharmaceutical grade level. The way that we recover all the hydrocarbons, we can do extremely efficiently and make you know that whole process which is going to be you know and is expensive to clean your uh, solvents, being able to reuse them over and over again and also clean them as you use them again is uh, something that has really started to improve the overall quality of um, and the, the safety of all solvent extraction. Um, it's uh, In the hydrocarbon industry, we have a pump called the Master Vapor, which is a diaphragm pump and that's the first pump in our solvent industry that's FDA certified besides the uh, piston-driven pumps used for CO2, which actually use food-grade grease on them because all piston-driven pumps are going to need some sort of lubrication and are intrinsically not the cleanest pumps in existence. So there's a lot of improvement even in the already pharmaceutical-grade industry that I'm really proud to say that cannabis is coming in and uh, not taking that as uh, a viable end to how safe and how clean you can make the product and having the correct hardware um, that's actually food grade and made uh, to process uh, products that are going to be used for human consumption. Um, we're taking these uh, aspects to another level and we're looking to make the cleanest uh, extraction processes which actually put um, you know, companies like Water, Waters, which is the biggest uh, CO2 extraction company that provides most of the superfluid CO2 extractors. When you go into any FDA-approved uh, analytical testing lab, 
um, you're, they're 90% of the time using their equipment, um, you know, all their pumps on their half a million dollar CO2 extractors are using a food grade grease, which I don't know about you, but I don't want food grade grease in any of my extracts, especially when uh, they're being consumed through uh, vaporization or combustion. Well, that's the big one. It's not food grade is something that goes into your stomach and stomachs are built to take a lot but vaporizing things and inhaling them into your lungs is a very, very, very different situation. I, I hear people use the argument, well, it's food grade. It's like, yeah, but you're not eating this. You're burning it, exactly. combusting it, vaporizing it, and <laughs> inhaling it into your lungs. It seems like a little bit of a different... Uh, 100%. 100%. So, yeah, um, I don't know. What else? So you wanted to go into a little bit of the basic process? Sure. So I guess, you know, most of the extraction processes that I'm talking about are to to isolate and extract um, micro-encapsulated resin glands. So I'm sure most of you are familiar where the, the medicinal components or recreational components or preventative components, whatever, whatever perspective your ego is convincing you that you're coming at this from, which cannabinoids really don't care whether you think it's medical, recreational, or preventative. It just works in your body the way it works. So water and screen, um, mechanical screen separation and rosin separations are well, not rosin, but the other two for sure, are, are micro-encapsulated resin glands. So water hash is using the benefit that the wax uh, membrane that's holding all of these oils inside the trichome. So just to give you guys a really short little sort of science lesson, you have the trichome head, the glandular trichome head. Um, there are inside that trichome head two different types of organelles, which are called vacuoles and plastids. And inside the vacuoles and plastids, are produced phenols and hydrocarbons, so alcohols and terpenes. And those are the building blocks for uh, all of the cannabinoids and all of the terpenes. Those are pushed upwards into the upper membrane of the glandular trichome, and there's a little fibrous mat in there that they settle into, and UVB light cooks down in it. First, it produces CBG, which is the first cannabinoid that's the precursor to all the other cannabinoids and the entire terpene profile. And so that's all happening in this little almost like lab inside the glandular trichome head. So with water extraction, what we're doing is we're freezing that wax membrane. And when you freeze wax, it becomes brittle. If you looked at a photo of a glandular trichome, it's like a large head sitting on a small stalk. And it's obvious that at the neck of the, the point of connection where the head joins the stalk, is where it becomes the most brittle. And so that's why water hash, uh, the two components of why water hash works. A, the wax membrane gets brittle and freezes. And when we mix the water in the ice mixture with the plant matter, the ice smashes back and forth and it basically breaks those little heads off of their little plant body prisons that they've been attached to. And due to their density, um, because they're made of oil, um, they're still affected by gravity and water, and so it's really why it allows almost anyone with a very little knowledge safely to extract. There's not a lot of education that's needed for water hash. There's not a lot of safety that's needed to be put in place aside from understanding microbials. You can teach anyone to do it in about a half an hour with the right tools. I use my own bubble bags, but there's all sorts of different water extraction kits on the market now since I've come out in 99. Um, and you know, those resin glands sink in the water due to their density, due to the fact that they're still affected by gravity, and everything else floats. So you create this transfer chamber in water where all the plant matter is floating, all the resin glands are sinking, and then of course you're also washing those resin glands. Anything that's on the outside of that head, for the most part, there are certain products like uh, Defender and Sulfur, which I really try to tell people, you know, it's not an ideal situation to, um, grow um, with these products. Glandular trichomes are present from the day the epicotyl pops out of the cotyledon. The cotyledon is the first two set of leaves on a seedling, which are the round leaves. They don't look like cannabis leaves. They're the first, they're the first set of leaves, but the first set of true cannabis leaves is called the epicotyl. They have serrated leaves, and it comes out from the cotyledon. And if you macroscopically photograph a, an epicotyl, you'll see that there are glandular trichomes already present. So when you hear people say, well, I don't spray in flower, I only spray in veg, they just don't have the understanding that there are glandular trichomes for that material to still stick to. And sulfur, I'm sure you would agree, is just a nightmare from all extraction processes. It comes out in the oil, it comes out in the hash, it comes out in dry sift, it comes out in rosin. I've never really found a way to get that out. I'm sure chemistry, there's 
chem solvents that you could use that would be multi-stage and perhaps a PhD in chemistry would be required. But for the most part, it's, it's, a, it's a big nightmare to, that I've always sort of promoted people to stay away from. Yeah, and the human nose is extremely sensitive uh, to tasting sulfur. So it's really easy for us to be our own analytical instruments when it comes to uh, sulfur and other different uh, things that make it into the plant material. You can actually taste it immediately. Um, you can almost oh, yeah. even smell it off of the uh, the product itself. Um, just you know, so everybody understands, it's kind of like that rotten egg kind of smell and taste, and you just can't miss it whatsoever. So that brings me to another interesting point: is how powerful our sense of taste and smell as human beings are. Um, for those who don't know, analytics are just different types of solvent extraction. So. Um, you know, a lot of times it's using superfluid CO2 extraction to actually do the analytics to try to see what's actually in the, ext the extracts that we're making. But when Mark's using mechanical methods and not damaging terpenes and uh, all different aspects of the plant material, um, and then you go and use some sort of very intense solvent extraction process to actually try to separate everything to get some analytics on it, you're going to actually destroy a lot of those uh, terpene spectrums and, and uh, plant materials that uh, you wouldn't, you know, you can't extract those with CO2 or chlorophyll or those other solvents that they're using to do the analytics. Um, we truly don't know what's what the true terpene spectrums are in in plants in general and you can easily see that by uh taking a plant material and doing having it analytically tested and comparing two different strains and you see a very very similar terpene spectrum according to the analytics but when you taste it yourself um, you actually taste something that's very very different completely different than uh, what the analytics are telling you. And what that tells me is that, um, you know, we're just at the beginning of being able to even break down the cannabis plant and see the full terpene spectrums and what's actually uh, in it, but we can definitely taste it. Um, so I was going to take it back as well to, you know, getting into safe extractions. I think, you know, taking it past spraying chemicals and having all these problems. There's a reason why the majority of growers have problems with bugs and infestations and diseases and pathogens and fungi that impregnate their plants. And that's generally that cannabis is one of the last clonally produced plants on the planet that we don't use tissue culture to propagate the, the plants. So for those of you that have a little or no understanding of tissue culture, there's a couple of different ways to do it. There's the sort of you know, the evil Monsanto way, which is callous tissue culture, where they're doing intercellular tissue culture, taking cells and putting them inside other cells and, and you know, doing this whole other work that I'm not going to be talking about. I want to talk about micropropagation, uh, mere stemic uh, tissue culture, which is basically kind of like microscopic cloning. Uh, you're cloning cells out of the mere stem, uh, the, the growth site of the plant, the part that those fresh two leaves are coming out of. And when you run, um, stage one of tissue culture is called initiation. And generally what they'll do is they'll, they'll cut the mere stem and they'll grow it in an, in an agar solution in a test tube. And as they grow it, you know, after a, a week or a month, they'll cut it again and grow that and cut it again and grow that. And what they're doing is they're cleaning the plant of all of these impregnated pathogens, fungi, and bacteria, including intercellular bacteria. And these things occur when we clone and grow and clone and grow and clone and grow. When you clone and put it inside um, a dome that's 100% humidity, um, you might have a, a small leaf on that clone that broke off where you didn't cut it e real close with a razor blade to the, to the body of the clone, to the stalk. And those little tiny pieces of plant matter become vectors uh, for pathogen, fungi, and uh, bacterial uh, infestations. And so it's much like people with candida you know, they might not look like they're dying, they might not look like they have cancer, but they're slower. Uh, they're not expressing themselves to their maximum ability, and plants are no different. So when you get a plant where, you've probably heard the term uh, from growers, genetic drift, 
Uh, genetic drift doesn't actually exist. It's really these pathogens and these fungi and these bacteria that have impregnated themselves into the plant, sometimes thousands of them just in that plant and you're cloning and sharing and cloning and sharing. It's just like a dirty, it's almost like a venereal disease that everyone's just sharing. Here, you have mine, I'll have yours. Let's just keep doing this. They're growing these super low quality clones and because these clones are so sick, they might not look sick, but they are sick. And when you're sick, you, you attract predators. You know, wolves don't hunt the healthy. They hunt the sick and the old and the young. And bugs and pests and diseases and pathogens and viruses are no different. They also hone in on the weak. And so when you're growing plants that are so impregnated with these pathogens and fungi and bacteria, you almost don't have a chance. You're going to get powdery mildew. You're going to attract bugs. You're going to, and when you get to a, you know, when you're doing it in a small grow, it's one thing you can pull it off. But when you're growing hectares, you know, like Driscoll's, the strawberry man, uh, uh, guys, those guys do. 10 billion tissue culture plants a year, 1.9 billion just for California that they grow in a single lab in Colorado. And initiation is one of the most important factors. Go ahead. Oh, five more minutes. Okay. Just that was to quick. Yeah, I just wanted to give you guys the lowdown on tissue culture because I think it's going to be an incredibly important aspect of both of our focuses. For me as an extractor, you know, I'm building a large, uh, like a 45,000 uh, square foot extraction lab in Vancouver here in the upcoming year. Uh, we're specializing in all the solventless extraction processes, but also large scale cryoethanol and, and CO2 extraction. And we're already... Um, creating relationships with companies like Segra International, which is a tissue culture company out of Vancouver, because the people we want to get to grow for us, we want to make sure that they're acquiring their clones as clean as they can possibly uh, acquire them, and that's going to be through tissue culture. Yeah, and that's an amazing point. I agree 100%. Yeah, yeah it's definitely something that uh, if you don't have to, you know, systemic diseases, diseases like powdery mildew and, and viruses and bacteria, they're... They're just sitting in the plant invisible. You don't even know they're, they're there. But if you can, you know, a company like Driscoll's, which Segra is going to be no different, they have a microbiology lab. They spent two years and a couple million bucks validating that lab. Uh, and so when you give them your genetics, you, they will initiate them and clean them all up for you and get them ready for mass production. They will put them through their microbiology lab. They will fingerprint the genetics so that when you order 10,000 or 100,000 or a million of your plantlets, you're going to get your DNA sequence that came with the plant that you gave them in the first place. So it's, it's assured that that is the plant that you've got. And then you'll also get certification that um, it's pathogen, fungi, and uh, bacteria free. And I think that's going to be a, a gargantuous step in the cannabis industry because right now we just have so many pests and so many diseases and, and so few people. And keep in mind, tissue culture is... Um, in every clonally produced plant that you consume, bananas, raspberries, blueberries, almonds, pretty much every one you've ever had, unless you went to an island and picked it wild off a tree, came from a tissue culture. So this is the present for all other plants, and it's only cannabis that is catching up. And I think we'll see this with all sorts of different aspects of cannabis, whether it be agriculturally or pharmaceutically or whatever it is. We're catching up by implementing these different aspects that have already been implemented into these other industries for you know dozens of years. Yeah, we like to say uh, never reinvent the wheel. We like to learn from other industries, and that's what's really going to accelerate the expansion and the scalability of cannabis 100%. Um, not to say that cannabis hasn't been pushing other parts of the industry and improving simple things like rotary evaporators and taking them to a whole different level. I think both big agriculture is going to add a lot to cannabis and cannabis is going to add just as much back to it. So I'm really excited about the future. Absolutely. Me as well. I guess uh, that's a wrap. Yeah, no, awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Um, Marcus Richardson and David Bogart. <laughs> David Schaefer. David Schaefer, everybody. Thanks, guys. Um, does anybody have any questions? We have uh, these, these extraction gods here. If anybody wants to know more about whatever is in there. Yes. Well, there's a variety of things you can do. Um, I like to be able to run it through reverse osmosis. I like to be able to control the pH. And I like to be able to run it through UV. 
to clear out any sort of uh, bacteria that could be potential. So there's, there's beautiful R R RO systems with UV lights uh, that you can set up to pH systems where you can control and dial in the pH to whatever you like. And that's, uh, they can be fairly expensive for large scale. You know, a lot of greenhouses use them for pepper and cucumber production. Um, but I, it, it will be no different for cannabis. The, the unit that I'm looking at for our lab is, is probably close to half a million dollars. And how effective is that RO on fluoride? My background is in dentistry, and I understand that fluoride is uh, an extremely small molecule and extremely difficult to remove from the water. Absolutely, it is. It's best if you can find water that's just never had it added to it. Absolutely. Weed and shrooms? Yeah, can you make it into one product by extracting from both of them? Yeah, I mean, you could do some different processes on extracting psilocybin and psilocin, and you could extract the cannabinoids and terpenes, and I guess you could mix them together in that sense. I would still do the extraction processes separate. I wouldn't put the herb and the mushrooms together. What about, what about yourself, Dave? I mean, you can extract two things separately and mix them together to make all sorts of different entourage uh, effects, I'm sure. But as far as uh, um, putting them together, you know, you can kind of mix anything together. So are there other things that you can mix with this weed? That when you're extracting it, that it makes it better? That makes it better? Like it enhances your mind because I've extracted from like the marijuana plant, but I've also extracted from like the native plant, for example. There's uh, right now, I think, um, there's a lot of salves out there. Um, used to, you know, um, there's a lot of different companies making mixtures of different things to where when you put them on your uh, skin, um, they have the cannabis aspects, but also using other essential oils and uh, other things with different properties um, to, uh, you know, like heal muscle pain and loosen up muscles. So I think the biggest space that we're seeing um, cannabis products mixed together is in the salves and, and uh, working on things like inflammation and muscle pain. That's where I see uh, the most things. And right now, it's just primarily been other essential oils and things that you'd see in, um, you know, like organic products that are good for reducing inflammation and muscle pain. So that's where I see that happening most. But um, in the U.S., uh, there was a few companies that tried to take cannabis terpenes and mix them with alcohol. Um, but, you know, the, you know, the U.S. is very sensitive about mixing anything with alcohol whatsoever. So that project was pushed to the side, and now they're um, mixing the terpenes uh, with uh, water, um, you know, just because alcohol itself is, you know, when, whenever you take different products and mix them together, you're uh, creating a whole new kind of effect, like you're saying. So you um, have to be kind of careful with that. Um, and the regulations definitely force people to be careful with mixing different types of products together like that. But in salves, I think, is where we're seeing cannabis mixed with other things to create an entourage effect besides the cannabis itself. Hey, guys. Um, I've, heard a, I've heard a lot of people say things like, well, this crop didn't turn out so well, so I'm just going to run it. Um, can you speak to the importance of using good flour and what you're looking for in a product that you want to use to make concentrates as opposed to people just trying to save a batch of bad flour? So I think there's a lot to be said about saving a batch of bad flour. It depends on what was bad about it. Um, you know, there are a lot of extremely effective ways to remediate pesticides out of product right now. And when you're testing the parts per billion, um, once it's finished, you know, uh, that's when you actually know that you've 100% removed it. There, Mark mentioned um, that people think that you can just fractionally distill out pesticides when that is incorrect. Um, a lot having to do with those boiling points of the pesticides being very close to the terpenes and cannabinoids. Um, but through other remediation processes that are getting better and better, I think uh, that's an extremely viable and valid place to use solvent extraction is to take 
uh, bad plant material, if you will, and when done 100% correctly and tested to the parts per billion, there are some situations to where a crop um, may not be the best crop, depending on what was going on with it, uh, that you can actually make some, a viable product that's safe and clean. But that's uh, been a new space where I actually see it happening to where um, I can actually say that, you know, this is a viable process. This has been cleaned 100% correctly. Um, but it's a very shaky road to go down and without amazing lab testing, you really don't know where you stand. Um, but there's a great future in that aspect of it. But I don't see a lot of, I see this as part of the growing process of the industry. I don't, um, you know, as people get better and better and move and progress forward, we'll see less and less of that, uh, especially in the legal market. Oh, that's a great point. Um, there's, <clears throat> I haven't seen, do you want to go on that, Mark? I mean, I, you know, what we do as extractors is we unveil quality. We don't produce quality. We unveil it. So the quality is either there or it's not there. That's done I by the genetics. I think she's talking about shelf life, though. Shelf life of the... Like Last the longest as in shelf life? Yeah. 100% solvent extraction on that one. Yeah, or removing the oxygen and replacing it with nitrogen can increase sh shelf life like a lot. I've seen that uh, a lot. This has been used in the... Uh, no, no, it doesn't ruin the product. It just keeps oxidization So the big occurring. thing is, is the solvent extraction is actually going to remove most of the water. And uh, that's a big aspect of degradation. Um, that and oxygen content within the extract itself. So right, which we, we just do with freeze dryers. Yeah. We just freeze dry the material and get like 100% of the water out. So. But when you compare like a mechanical and rosin uh, type of extraction, the shelf life is considerably less than like a hydrocarbon extraction, 100%. I'm more focused on producing a product that you don't want to keep for a long time because you smoked it in the first day that you got it. I still have BHO from years past that is still uh, at the same quality as uh, the day that uh, I put it away. Yeah, my oldest hash is 12 years old right now. Seriously? So when yeah. you get you Oh, yeah. In they, fact, I have resin here, not here on me, but here in Toronto, that's six years old, and it was louder than probably 80% of the stuff I saw yesterday. Every single person that smelled it just went, wow. It can, absolutely. It just depends on how you store it, right? You want to keep it out of the light. You want to keep oxygen away. If you cool it, if you keep it in a freezer or a fridge, you're going to extend the life cycle in, in, infinitely almost. That's very good to know. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Cool. Thanks. Thank <laughs> Sweet. <laughs>